Hello, Algebra 2. We're, start, uh, we're moving on now to Chapter 2, starting with uh, Section 2.1. Section 2.1 is largely an exercise in learning and working with specific, specific vocabulary, vocabulary that we're going to be using again and again throughout the year. In addition, there are some other things. I say there are five things, so there are also these four things that you will need to know. You'll need to be able to graph a relation. You'll need to be able to use something called the vertical line test that I'm going to explain in a little bit. You're going to have to be able to graph a function that's an equation, and you're going to have to be able to find the value of something called f of negative 3. But the key point is the vocabulary from this section. So here are the terms that I'm going to be going over in this video. If you want, you might want to pause the video at this point and note these down. Okay, I'm going to assume that you did that, and I'm going to go through each of them in turn, and I'm going to assume as we go along that you're going to be taking notes and that you'll be clear about what these vocabulary terms mean, starting with relation. So what is a relation? Well, it's a comparison of two sets of data. Now, um, you may feel as though there is a reason for a relation between these two sets of data, but you can compare any two sets of data if you want to. You can compare eye color and IQ if you want to. Um, but generally speaking, we tend um, just naturally to pick sets of data that we think have some sort of um, logical relationship between each other. So for example, tree age and tree height, you might think that there's some sort of logical relation between them. But at this point, we're just comparing the two sets of data. Similarly, if you're doing a study of tourism, you might think there's some sort of relation between the month of the year and the number of tourists that you see walking around town. Town and health, maybe you're doing a study comparing different towns and you think that health statistics might vary depending on the town you're looking at. Or you might even think that your astrological sign or a person's astrological sign has some sort of relation uh, with their good fortune. Now the textbook substitutes a different word, two different words for comparison. It uses the word pairing, like pairing a, a pair of two items, uh, or a mapping of sets of data. And we'll get into these terms, and I hope they're clearer as we go along with the video. Coordinate plane, though, is the next vocabulary term, and a coordinate plane is simply the xy plane. You will see this phrase, though, coordinate plane, sometimes on standardized tests, sometimes on tests that I give, and I often get questions by students saying, so what's a coordinate plane again? And that's all that I'm talking about is this right here, an xy plane. Quadrants. You may be familiar with the fact that there are quadrants to the coordinate plane, the xy plane, but you may not remember which they are. The top right corner where everything is positive, both x and y are positive, is the first quadrant or number one. From there it rotates counterclockwise around to the fourth quadrant and the fourth quadrant is immediately below the first quadrant. Ordered pair. It's a phrase that um, comes up periodically. All that I really mean by the ordered pair for that red point there is the x and y values that go with that coordinate. 1 and 4, 1 being the x value, and 1, 2, 3, 4 being the y value for that point. Domain and range. Now we get into terms that aren't necessarily familiar from Algebra 1. Some students do cover this uh, with their teachers in Algebra 1, but some don't. Domain and range refer to the x and y values of a relation. The domain is all of the x values in the set. Now, when we're talking about um, an equation, we are, tend to be talking about all of the possible x values. And range is all of the possible y values. As we go along in the year, we're going to find some equations, um, some relations, where there are limits on either the domain or the range or both. And in that case, we might say x can't be certain numbers. It can't be less than this or more than that. And the same might be true for y. We might say for the range that it has some limits. All right, let's look at some practical examples here. Domain and range for a linear function like you might have studied back in Algebra 1. Well, again, the domain is all of the permissible um, uh, x values. Range is all of the permissible y values, all of the ones that are in the set. With these arrowheads at the end, this is indicating there is no limit to the right. There's no limit to the left, 
Similarly, there's no limit downward or upward. When you've got a 45 degree angle like this, it's saying it's going to go on in both x and y directions that way and also both x and y directions that way. So in this case, we would say that any number, or at least any real number, and we will talk about imaginary numbers later in the year, but any real number um, can be in the x set, can be in the domain, and any real number can be in the y set, can be in the range. Here's um, a more practical example of an xy um, uh, graph. In this case, now maybe you've never studied or even thought about the population of Costa Rica, but you've probably seen population graphs like this before. The interesting thing about this graph is that it doesn't happen to show arrowheads at the end. Often we forget, but sometimes we mean it for a reason. Since we don't know, we're going to have to treat it as though there really is a limit to the domain. At least this is the limit to our knowledge. Sure, there were people living in Costa Rica before 1960, and sure there have been after 2011, but we don't know the numbers. So the domain is the set of X data that we have. And in this case, it extends from 1960 to 2011. That's the domain. The range is the set of Y value that we have. Within that domain, the population was always let's say that's roughly 1.3 million. It was always, and, and let's say that up there is 4.8. The range was always between 1.3 and 4.8 million. That's what we would have to say the range is based on the picture that we have. Here's a graph much like something that we really will be working with later in the year. Now I got this straight from a graphing calculator like you guys should be acquiring soon. Um, and graphing calculators don't put arrowheads. There ought to be one right there. But there is intentionally not. There's a dot here. There really is a starting point for this image. And we will often this year work with equations and graphs that have a starting point. Because of this, there are limits to the domain and range for this equation. Um, X has to be greater than or equal to zero. There are not going to be in this picture any dots, any points on the graph to the left of the starting place. Likewise, there aren't going to be any y values that result that are below, I'm going to say that's roughly three and a half. So there aren't going to be any y values down here. It's almost like a launching spot. You launch from there in this particular graph and go upward and to the right. Now it does go infinitely to the right and we can assume, since we don't have any reason to think that it comes back down, that it continues infinitely upward as well. So it can be all the way to infinity in both directions, but it can't be below 3.5 for y or below 0 for x. Okay, go ahead and hit the pause button and try it yourself. All right, I'm going to assume that you did that. Here are the answers that I would have been looking for. Actually, let's just start with the domain. The domain can be any number. That arrowhead there and that arrowhead there suggests that it goes on infinitely in both those directions. Another way to say any number, and I'll often use this phrase, all real numbers. X, or the domain, is equal to all real numbers in this picture, in this blue graph. Range, though, has a limit. Has to be greater than or equal to 2. You don't see and won't see on this graph any Y values below 2. All right, um, independent versus dependent variables. We talked about these examples before and how we thought there were relations. So independent variables are the inputs. One way of thinking of it is, what's the information you would type into the computer to get the answer? So you might type in a particular tree age, hoping to find out what the predicted tree height would be. Or you might type in the month June and hope to figure out how many tourists can I expect? The dependent variable is the output. It's what the computer tells you. When we graph these, the independent, which always goes with the input, is always put on the graph on the x axis. The de dependent, which goes with the output, is always put on the y axis. So notice this and remember this. Independent, or in other words, input is always along the x. Dependent, or in other words, output, is always put on the y. So as some examples are, are shown here, we might expect to see 
to put tree age here and see the result, the tree height changing along the y-axis. And remember input and output and how they relate. Input goes with independent, output goes with dependent. These last three terms I'll come to in a few minutes as we go farther along in the video, but I'm going to move on now to the second thing I've got to teach you, which is graphing a relation. Now I know you know how to do this. I know how you, to know, you know how to plot these points. So I've just gone ahead and done it here. That's all we're talking about. But do remember, if I give you a table like this, you cannot just automatically assume that you can connect these dots. If I ask you to graph a relation and these are the only data points you have, then they literally are points. Same thing here. This is real data as opposed to something made up. These are the scores of the uh, winners of the US Open Golf Championship during the years 1986 to 1996. And I've plotted each of those points in the same way as before. Now, third thing, there's something called the vertical line test. The vertical line test tells you something about a relation. A vertical line test is almost like a vertical slicer that looks at the data once it's graphed and it creates not exactly an error message but an important um, indicator if you ever make a vertical slice and hit two things at once. This vertical line test here, we would say it's violated here. That means that this relation, whatever this x is, let's say it's uh, astrological sign and whatever this y is, let's say it's your good fortune, there is no functional relationship between the two. There's no function um, between astrological sign, in my opinion, and your good fortune. So you might have this astrological sign and you might have very good fortune, but somebody else with the same sign might, might not. On the other hand, over here, every time I cut vertically, I never hit two points. So that is what the vertical line test is. Cutting vertically, do you ever hit two points? So here are the examples I showed you. Notice I would never hit two points that way. And likewise, as it turns out, I never do here either. So in terms of the vertical line test, both those last two pictures are functions. Mapping diagrams is another way of representing a relation. You can list off all the inputs and then identify any outputs that come from them. Now notice in this case, this one led to two different outputs. That means this input-output diagram does not represent a relation. By contrast, in B, you never have a case where any input gives you two different outputs. You never have a case where any input gives you two different answers is another way of thinking of it. So even though there are two different ways to get to this output, this is a function on the right, B. Okay, so some, um, some different ways of deciding whether or not something's a function. As I say, one way is to use the vertical line test. Another way, whether you call it a mapping diagram or a table, each x value can only produce one y value. Or you could say each, x, each value of the independent variable, remember that's the x value, can only produce one dependent variable. So um, remember that's x and that's y. But the way I think of it, I think of a function as a calculator. When I put information or ask a question of a calculator, I expect it to give me the same answer to that particular question every time. If I ever ask the same answer, I mean the same question of a calculator and get two different answers, I would throw it away. So in order for a relation to be a function, just like a calculator, that relation has to always give me the same consistent answer, not two different choices, every time I put in a particular x value, a particular input. Okay, I'm going to actually stop the video here. I can see that I'm going to run beyond the 15 minute um, technical limit that I have on videos. I really don't think it's going to be more than a few minutes more for the rest of the lesson, but I need to stop at this point and pick it up with a part two.